the gravity of the time is such that every new avenue of peace, no matter how dimly discernible, should be explored. Never before in history has so much hope for so many people been gathered together in a single organization. You will provide a great share of the wisdom, of the courage, and the faith which can bring to this world lasting peace for all nations and happiness and well-being for all men. Well, today we are here with Rory O'Sullivan, the North American CEO of Moltex Energy. Welcome to Titans of Nuclear, Rory. Good morning. It's great to be here. Yeah, good to be here. Um, so yeah, so we're at the WNE conference in Paris, France. You are from Ireland, and you were originally, and you're now in Canada, um, working um, with with Moltex in the North American uh, region. And we originally interviewed about two years ago, three years ago in 2018, the co-founder um, and the UK CEO. Ian Scott, but it's yep. great to be back and to hear an update about what all you guys have been up to in the past three years. Yeah, thanks. Well, you guys have been doing a lot in the last two years as well since then. You've had <laughs> a right. lot of different people on, so it's great to be here. Yeah, so let's um, let's start back at, at your beginning and, and tell the, the Roy O'Sullivan story, if you will. Um, so how did you first enter the energy space, enter the nuclear space? What got you interested in this to begin with? Yeah, sure. So. Um, I, uh, I graduated mechanical engineering, like as a mechanical engineer, from Trinity College Dublin and Lincey de Lyon in France. In France. Mm -hmm. um, I actually graduated anti-nuclear. Really? I was, uh, uh, most Irish people are anti-nuclear. They're because of the waste, because of the cost, and because yeah. of safety, the usual reasons. Um, I was on the fence, but I ended up anti-nuclear. So uh, I thought I'd go and work on a wind farm. And, and there was a lot of wind in Ireland. And so you say when you graduated, but you did go to school in France as well, where nuclear is incredibly popular. Yeah, yeah, it's true. But um, nuclear wasn't really part of the curriculum when I was there. I was there for a year and a half, and we didn't we didn't cover nuclear. Okay. Um, in Ireland, we did we did some, and uh, yeah, so decided to fall on the anti-nuclear fence. All right, all right. Um, so, but it, there was a big wind industry in Ireland at the time. Yeah. So I went and worked on a wind farm down on the west coast. I was this is going to be the future. And then after about six months down there, I realized wind is not going to solve the planet's problems. There and was like, you know, they were just destroying the countryside, huge, big trucks, like wrecking the land. So it was mostly onshore wind. In it was Ireland. onshore wind when onshore wind was just starting out. Mm -hmm. right? So it was mm -hmm. very expensive. Um, and since, since like that was what, I don't know, 20 years ago or something, um, 50, whatever, however many. And uh, now I can't believe it has got so much cheaper. It yeah. really has got much cheaper, but it's still you know, using huge land usage, taking up beautiful countryside. Mm -hmm. So um, after the six months there, I realized, yeah, this is not going to solve the planet's problems. So I was very dismayed by energy and went and got a job in London, England. Okay, doing? Uh, construction, project management. Um, so I started out as an engineer on site, mechanical engineer, um, kind of worked my way up. In the end, I was running about a, uh, a 60 million pound mix commercial residential unit. Uh, running about 350 people on site. A really exciting day to day, love the job, um, but the bigger picture just wasn't very interesting. You know, it's just construction. Right, right. Um, I was still always interested in en energy. It was around 2014 when I heard about the conce concept of molten salt reactors. So molten salt reactors and this different type of nuclear technology that promises to be safer and, and has all these additional environmental benefits that kind of helped sway you back, first of all, into the energy space, where the things that were dismaying you were the environmental impacts, the cost, um, and and kind of ultimately just not being too too enthralled by energy in general. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And you know, molten salt reactors. Even back then, there was no, there was like maybe one. The Chinese had a startup that was right. about it, um, but they had the potential to deal with the waste, the potential to be low cost, and the potential to have a radical improvement in safety. And, and how did you first hear about molten salt? Was it by reading papers, like hearing a lecture? So I attended a lecture um, that was organized by an 84 year old Jasper Tomlinson. Um, he set it up through the Institute of Mechanical Engineers in London. 
Okay. Um, and I went along, just, you know, got an email, this lecture, nuclear innovation, okay, let's go have a listen. And I knew that day that I was stuck, this is the future. Wow. And nobody in the industry had heard about molten salt reactors then. I mean, literally, you ask anybody in the industry, they didn't know what they were. And this was a technology that was developed and, and or not developed, but conceived of and written about, you know, decades ago at the beginning of, of the nuclear um, power sector, 50 years ago or so in, in the laboratory setting, but it has never really been thought of as a potential commercial viable energy source. Exactly. You know, there was the prototypes in the 60s, there was some work in the 70s, but really then it was put on the shelf. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until um, people like uh, Kirk Sorensen now with Flybe Energy, David LeBlanc of Terrestrial Energy, who started to go back and, and, and look at this. And Ian Scott, the founder mm -hmm. of Multex, was one of those at the same time. Um, so I hadn't, I hadn't met uh, any of them, Multex, uh, Multex or any of them at the time. Um, but I was fascinated. So myself and Jasper, the 85 year old, we, we got together and said, we want to do something about this. So what we did was we uh, got a government, UK government grant yeah. about not, you know, 75,000 pounds or something. And we got, um, he put up some money and Fraser Nash Consultancy put up some mm -hmm. money and we did an evaluation of molten salt reactors to be able to build a prototype in the UK. Okay. And that was, yeah, looking at the various kind of concepts and ideas that are around at the time. So this is just kind of an academic study, but, but with the intent to see if it would be viable from an economic perspective, from a supply chain perspective, or what all were you evaluating? That, yeah, that's it. I mean, really, the objective was, which is could a molten salt technology be developed in the near term for you know large-scale commercial rollout? Was it feasible, essentially? Mm -hmm. And so we got up this pool of experts around to, to, to look at all the different options. Um, and it was pretty quick that we saw that the Multex design that was really just Ian Scott in his basement, um, a, a fancy big house in the countryside rather than the basement, but still, um, had come up with the idea. Uh -huh. right? But you know, it had, had, the, had the basics and the main patents and the, and the technology there. And I got into this by, I took a year off work and, and uh, I studied maybe you know, at night for two years before this and then got this pool of experts together to do this evaluation mm -hmm. um, with that. We set up a company, Energy Process Developments, and the report is, you know, still, I think still out there mm -hmm. online. It was, it was looked, used a lot of the time, Molten Salt um, MSR Feasibility Study. Uh, it's, it's an interesting read, I think. Um, but anyway, uh, quite quickly into that study, we found that the Multex design was, you know, way ahead of the rest in terms of likelihood for near-term development. Mm -hmm. And that's because of the unique patents and the, the ability to put fuel in tubes. Yes. So we were looking at collaborating with the with, with Ian as the founder of the team I, we, I had set up there, looking at collaborating, different, doing different projects, and then really it made sense to actually just merge with Multex, and mm -hmm. that's what happened. The team that we had set, set up ended up just merging with Multex. And, and, and so what was your that. role then when you merged into the, the Multex company with, with Ian? Well, there wasn't really a company then, it was Ian, you know? It was yeah. Ian, and, and he, had, he had already come across the partner, John Durham, who put mm -hmm. up the first million pounds. Um, so it was really at that point um, we started to look and expand and recruit people. So um, that's when it became a company, and yeah. So I was leading operations really. Might made a role there with the first few years before I moved to Canada. Was chief operating officer, chief operating officer. Mm -hmm. um, but it was very small at the time. We were looking for where's the best country to deploy the technology. Right, right. Um, and so when you were looking across the the technological landscape, obviously, or the the country landscape. So obviously there's there's the demand, right? In the UK, you know, you probably part of why the government was so eager to um, to sponsor these studies and to be involved in this process to date is there is a lot of energy need and decarbonization need, and you know the, the current fleet is retiring, and so SMRs and AMRs um, and, and different types of, of technologies need to be on the horizon. So there's there's a great need to sponsor that type of work. Um, of course, you're now in Canada. Um, so, so what were you looking at? Regulatory, supply chain, um, economics, energy demand? Yeah, so we were looking at um, a, a regulator that was able to license innovative designs. Mm -hmm. uh, we were looking for customers that wanted you know, new nuclear power and needed clean energy um, and, and generally a good ecosystem. And we thought the UK had a lot of that. What was interesting is really the UK was focused then on big nuclear right. um, and there was no customer available. Mm. 
which mo you wouldn't really notice when you first look at the UK because it's a very big industry. But actually, EDF is the French government, and they're the only they're the only utility oper nuclear operator in the country. Canada has a, a very well not special situation, but a very um, very good environment in this regard because there's several uh, utility customers that don't have a technology bias. Mm -hmm. So as soon as we went over to Canada to look and, and speak to them, it was a very different discussion because they are they need low carbon solutions, economic development, all the same things, but they didn't have any biases. They were just looking for the best solution. Right. And so we had great traction immediately in Canada because uh, I think we had a great solution. Yeah, and so where where are we in time now? Is this around 2016? Yeah, um, this is probably 2016. Um, I spent time in Malaysia, I spent time in Indonesia, I was back and forth to China five times in a couple of years then. We were in India a couple of times. We looked, obviously the USA, we looked everywhere right. to, for the best. The Canada best had kind of the right, the right Canada really had the right that. mix. It yeah. um, has a good regulatory environment. It has customers, of course, there's a need for um, new clean energy solutions and it has an established nuclear industry right. that was open to innovation. Right, right. That being the most kind of... And a regulator that's, that's open and to And a regulator to that... that and it, regulator's framework is ready for innovation. Right, right. So, okay, so you s establish operations in Canada, you become the North American CEO. Uh, we are doing the vendor design review, which okay. is the Canadian you know, regulatory process for vendors from the UK. We started from the UK, uh, started submissions, like first submission December 2017, and then it was around February 2018 that New Brunswick Power, that we, right. we came across New, New Brunswick Power and they were doing their technology evaluation. And there wasn't really any utilities at this point that were seriously looking into SMRs. They were the first. Okay. Um, and they were looking at 90 different technologies they, they, and they selected us and ARC uh, as the top two technologies to work with. They were also looking for partners to move to New Brunswick instead of a presence here. We were you know, looking at options to move to Canada. So it was just really good timing. Mm -hmm. It was a really good fit. So that's when I moved over to New Brunswick. It was July, uh, maybe July, August uh, 2018 to start up the Canadian operations Perfect. properly. Excellent. And so, um, so I guess at this, at this time, you are establishing your team, growing, growing the company. And at what point do you, are you ready to enter into the regulatory process? Or is that, that's actually, you just entered into the regulatory process. Yeah, we had just started it. We were kind of starting it slowly. Right. Um, and, uh, and we were building the team at the same time. You know, uh, Kinetrix, some of the suppliers in Canada and the UK were helping us through that process, uh, helping us build the team. It was around mid 2018 when we had our investment from IDEM. Mm -hmm. IDEM, our major European engineering firm, they were looking at different technologies and, and they decided to, to invest in us. So that really helped build our team because they were able to you know, send us as many engineers right. as we like to be able to, to, right. to scale up fast. Great. So, yeah, so what was kind of that, that period like, you know, when you establish operations, when you establish operations and you're ready to, you know, your design is final enough that there are no more changes to be made, it's ready to be submitted to the regulator. Um, you know, you have to build up a supply chain, you have to build up staff, you have to build up your safety case, you have to perform all different types of analyses, you have to build a fuel supply chain um, as well. What have what has that process been like? The past uh, few years? It was exciting. Um, it's it has been a lot of ups and downs. Um, what some of the learning with the regulatory process, you know, looking back, you'd always do things differently, of course. But what was a really big challenge is we had people from all over the world working on the project, and translating how you do a nuclear design and how you do nuclear safety was really very challenging. Um, because we were trying to do it in the Canadian language, the way Canadian regulators and the Canadian industry is familiar with, but a lot of our expertise were, you know, from Spain, from the UK, from the USA, from uh, France, uh, Asia, um, and 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 that that was a real struggle. So we were trying to develop our own procedures and our you know safety processes, um, but bringing we had such a diverse background, it was very tedious to get that uh, to get that off the ground. Fascinating. And you would think that having kind of all of those different perspectives would actually be really smart in the, the long run, right? So you build your first few plants in Canada, license under the Canadian regulator, but then, you know, hopefully you've kind of thought about all these other different perspectives and ways of, of thinking about safety that allow your technology to then be either, you know, a new license given or, or you know, uh, exported to other countries under different regulatory paradigms. So I think now, you know, now looking back, it's great. <laughs> I mean, it's, great. All, it's absolutely not done, but it's a long way to go. But um, 
w we have got to a really good place today because we've had that really diverse right, input. Right. Right. Um, but the the need to have it aligned with the specific regulator you're going to is very very important. Mm -hmm. Of course, you can take you know innovative approaches to any regulator, but it's a challenge because you've really got to go and, and and spend a long time going through why this process is different to the way regulators have seen it before. Right. Right. So um, yeah, at the moment, you know, we've got our main fundamental procedures done and our management system mostly done, but there's a long way to go. There's a lot of details we've still got to go and it's a big focus of ours at the moment as we prepare for phase two of the vendor design review process. So what was phase one? You're just submitting a basic design, making sure there's no huge red flags. You kind of check, you know, just high level boxes and, and okay, this looks all right. There's nothing we're too scared of, we can move on. Or what all does that entail? Yeah, so it's it's really, I mean, it's actually more of an assessment of the vendor than the design in mm. phase one. And, you know, you wouldn't really read that from the paperwork, but that's the intent, is the, the regulator wants to know that you are a competent designer that can design a safe reactor. Mm. So um, the submissions are partly, you know, how you do the design, it's half how you do the design and, and your companies to do it, and what the actual design looks like. because they sensibly, they understand the design's going to evolve as you progress the details. So they're really more interested in, in you know, are we going to control the changes and safely manage this design process as we get through the various phases of design and construction? Because even when you get, you know, design built, it's right. going to evolve uh, on, on the ground over time. Right, right. So, so they're really just checking for organizational competency, uh, right? Yeah. That, that, that's a, I would say they're not just checking for that. That's a major. Right, but that's the kind it's of probably the biggest part. Biggest of it. piece, maybe half of kind of the. Yeah, yeah, check. half or more, and then there, um, you know, the phase two, the the what you get is a sentence saying you have no fundamental barriers to licensing. Okay. So the phase one is you know you're on track to to get into phase two and 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 do give the details. So I think of another way of saying it is, phase one is this is how you're going to give the details to demonstrate that. Right. So you're giving the methodologies and the high level principles and often the claims. Mm -hmm. And then in phase two, you give the details of all the analysis and, and, and the justification behind everything. So you guys are a startup, which means funding and time is really important, right? So how talk to me about the timeline of the regulatory process and how you see that kind of working with, with your company and, and you know whether how you will be successful um, through this. So how long was the first phase of the regulatory process and then how much longer um, do you expect the rest of the, the review to, to be and kind of from that you know startup mentality I expect you are pushing for things to be as streamlined and efficient um, as possible so that you, you aren't spending you know, a billion dollars in the regulatory queue. Yeah, and, and some of that attitude is not compatible with operators. So we have a bit of a, you know, utilities are very conservative. And thankfully, you know, we're working with um, New Brunswick Power and Ontario Power Generation who are very innovative and open, but they're still big utilities that are very risk averse. So mm. um, there's sometimes some, you know, alignment that needs right. to happen there. But the phase one took, I think, about two years. I don't remember the exact time frame uh, now. Uh, we're preparing for phase two. And the overall timeline is to be finished that around the end of 2024. Um, and so our old development, that's the phase two of the development period as well. And that's what our agreements with MB Power are, uh, you know, clear milestones up mm -hmm. through that through that period. Um, then we have phase three, which is really the detailed design phase where we and our partners will be doing the detailed design. MB Power will be leading the licensing activities at that point. I see. So, so we'll be providing the design information to them and they'll be making the submission, submissions to... to right, them. because as the operator, they also have an, a very important role that the regulator needs to and have kind of that same assurance of, of competency um, oh, yeah. for this design. Can can this, you know, obviously competent operator, because they, they do have uh, nuclear assets, um, but they haven't ever operated this specific, uh, you know, type of, of coolant or, or you know, molten salt, let alone, you know, this, this design. I think in the UK that's called the intelligent customer, is that correct? Yep, and um, Canada's adopting similar language actually, but they're, they're the licensee, they're the one with responsibility and they will be design authority of the, of the plant. Right. So, you know, at a certain point, like typically commissioning, we will pass over the ownership of the design to the operator um, and so that's what the, uh, the one of the things that the regulator will be looking for that they then have that competency to really understand and own the design as they as they manage it over the years. But yeah. they're already a, you know a very competent operator that's well respected with CNSC. Mm -hmm. So that's that's the, that's the 
the first hurdle is already overcome. Fantastic. Um, and so I guess um, I'm kind of curious to, to think more about some of the challenges that you're or you're going to be doing over the next few years while you're going through the regulatory process, right? So you said through the next four years will be the licensing process um, for, for the next phase. So are you doing any things in parallel with licensing so that as soon as you get your license, you can start construction, you know, start assembly, if you're doing factory assembly, kind of talk to you about the other things that are happening in parallel with, with regulatory. Yeah, well, just to clarify, on the, the, in Canada, the vendor design review is really, um, gives confidence to investors and utilities to be able to do their licensing process. So it's, it's actually an optional process, mm. which is different to the USA and, and, and other countries where the design will be certified. Um, so, but irrelevant, it's, it's so pre-licensing is really the word. Yes. But as we're doing, as we're doing that, that process, um, yeah, there's a million and one other things going on. The biggest challenge for us is we have decided to take on the, the challenge of recycling spent fuel. Right. So, um, you know, back, you know, in the early days, we decided that one of the biggest challenges to nuclear power is nuclear waste. And it's always going to be the Achilles heel of nuclear power. So we decided, you know, a startup doing a new nuclear reactor is, is, uh, is a challenge, but we wanted to go all the way. And Why also, <laughs> and yeah, yeah, while we're doing it, let's go all the way and, uh, and build a, you know, a recycling plant as well. Um, so half or more of our effort now is going into that technology. So we've really got two mega projects and the, and the, you know, we're set up in that way that we've got two mega projects going on. And that recycling plant walks waste to stable salts needs to be on first because right. that has to be operating for two, two, two and a half years, producing the fuel for the reactor. And does, does that require its own licensing process? As oh well? yes, absolutely. Okay. And so where are you in that process? You have to design that it's just like what we just talked about. You design the facility, you know, finalize all of those plans and then kind of go through this whole process once again. Yeah, because it's no, it's, you know, totally new. Um, Canada's never had a reprocessing facility. Um, most countries haven't. Um, there's no vendor design review equivalent. So we have a, a process called the four-step process with the CNSC. Um, and at the moment, you know, we're in pre-discussions with them about, you know, how we go, how we, how it will be licensed mm -hmm. with MB Power. Um, we're also working with them and with the IAEA on safeguards and incorporating safeguards at the earliest stage to make sure you know it's in line with best practices. Um, but through the the period now, you know we're doing our experiments with uranium uh, simulated fission products on that to really demonstrate that it will you know absolutely work as expected and and, and convert the spent fuel. Around the similar time frame, we'll be uh, developing a pilot plant for that mm -hmm. to demonstrate at a larger scale with real spent fuel. And so, who is the supplier of spent fuel? Are you getting it from New Brunswick Power or just any anyone in Canada with with existing? Yeah, spent the, fuel? the model internationally is that we'd have one of our recycling plants watts adjacent to where there's already spent fuel, mm -hmm. typically. So it, it depends so country to country. Or on or adjacent to the site yeah. of, of an existing So plant. in Canada, we're in New Brunswick and the spent fuel there. So we'll be putting the Watts plant and the reactor on the same site. We've, we don't need to move spent fuel around, right. which is a huge advantage. And we'll still have some waste at the end that has to move, but generally um, we won't be moving it. Uh, you know, when hopefully we go and build plants in Ontario as well, this, it's still open whether we do you know one or two centralized facilities or one per, per reactor site is still up in the air mm -hmm. in the US you'd probably do it regionally perhaps you know one watts plant per operator for so several reactors in the UK everything is typically gone through Sellafield and there's good rail networks so we'd have right. one watts plant for the whole country I see and so are you working with other um, international uh, reprocessing experts obviously you work here in France um, you know to kind of either learn from the regulatory process or a lot of these kind of complex challenges like transportation, like, um, you know, safeguard and security and all these different things that go along with <laughs> with this type of endeavor. Um, yes, the expertise are very hard to find. Mm. There's, you know, there's really very few people have been working on this in the last 10 or 20 years. So it's been a real challenge to get the right expertise uh, on board. So we've mostly got that. Obviously, we have people in our, you know, in-house that we've that we've got on board. Some great skills and great expertise that we're very proud of. Um, but we then have worked with specialist companies. Mm -hmm. And like there's one company in the UK, DBD, that have done a lot of work on, on specialist reprocessing facilities around the world. We've we've leveraged them quite heavily. Um, some specialists in France, some in Japan, and we'll continue to use them um, uh, their expertise more and more in the future. 
One of the things that we uh, are doing now and will be doing in the future is um, your policy work on this space. Mm. Because uh, although, uh, you know, in Canada, as an example, there's no specific policy saying you can't reprocess. It is, it, it, it is an option available. Um, it's obviously quite kind of controversial. Right. So we have been and will continue to do uh, outreach to the public and governments to, you know, ensure this is you know, what the public wants. Yeah. I'm actually curious about the cost of, of, of this whole part of, of your, your company. So when you're talking about reprocessing, right, I think the way that the models that are, that are currently in operation are government funded, right? But you're essentially creating a supply chain for your own plants or for your, your operator. Um, so, so what are the economics like for reprocessing and kind of at, including that in the whole um, overall vision for Multex? Yeah, well, let me, um, there's two parts to the cost, of course. There's the reactor cost and the, and the, and the watts cost. So right. let me start with the reactor cost. Is we made some pretty bold claims um, when we first started this. Uh, we, in 2016, roughly, we had an independent cost estimate by Atkins in the UK, mm -hmm. which came out around 2,000 pounds per kilowatt. Oh, wow. And 35 pounds a megawatt hour. And then US, that was around $2,700 um, US and um, 45 cents per kilowatt hour. Is that the right units there? Four and a half cents a kilowatt hour. Um, and now we've recently updated those cost estimates and we are you know, obviously delighted and very proud that they have come in line with those original cost estimates. Really? That's it's around, just around 3,000 US dollars per kilowatt capital cost and, uh, and similar uh, OPEX costs. So, you know, this is all about cost at the end of the day. And so having those low capital costs is what's going to enable the large scale rollout of nuclear power because countries aren't, you can do a lot of talk about climate change and getting low carbon solutions, but at the end of the day, if it's going to increase bills, it's not going to happen. Right. So that's on the reactor side. Um, on the watt side, there's a lot more uncertainty mm -hmm. around the, 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 the cost estimate because it's so new. Um, but we seem to have very big margins. Okay. Even if we just look at the cost of the watts plant and operation of the watts plant comparing to the need to buy fresh uranium fuel, mm. it looks like our fuel conversion recycling facility will be cheaper than buying regular uranium fuel. And have you guys, when you're looking at the economics heat and, and for the watt side, how are you thinking about, and I, I'm not as familiar with, with Canada's system, but obviously in the United States, you know, we have, um, you know, a pool of money, if you will, for, for uh, spent fuel that the government provides or that the utilities provide the government collects that could be technically tapped into how how does that work the kind of the utility and government funding that might be able to go to you because you are solving the problem right that that all of this funding is being yep. set aside well, for yeah you hit the nail on the head there there's a there's a very big liability in every country that has nuclear waste and in in most countries it's similar the operator pays a fee per megawatt hour that goes into a fund for um, uh, for future disposal. Canada's estimated liability at the moment is around $25 billion. The US, it's around $45 billion. Um, the UK, I think, is around $20, $25 billion. I don't recall the exact number. So um, what we are doing is assessing the various waste routes. Mm. And in Canada, we're working with the Nuclear Waste Management Organization to really understand what the most appropriate waste uh, route is for our various waste streams because what we do is we take that. About waste route, you mean like intermediate, high level, like like. Yeah, okay. and exactly the, the technical route of how we're going to dispose uh -huh. of that because we're taking large volumes of high level waste, separating that into various streams, of taking say if the can do bundle is twenty two kilos of high level waste, mm -hmm. well we take out all of the long lived transuranic, so everything heavier than uranium on the on the uh, periodic table. Mm -hmm. And then that's so less than 1% of it. And we turn that into chloride form and that's what we can put into our reactor. When it comes out of our reactor, about um, roughly half of that long lived transuranic 300,000 year radioactive waste no longer exists. Mm. It is destroyed. It has been converted to clean energy. Mm -hmm. Literally um, matter into energy E equals MC squared. Mm. It then creates a shorter lived waste fission products, but they're much, much easier to deal with. Um, and then so the output of our reactor, we can then recycle it and put it back in again. Mm -hmm. So that process goes around in the wind. Mm -hmm. But that was really just 1% of, right. the, of the original. So you have the 99% of the original bundle still 
there. Yeah. You have roughly another 1%, or actually it's, it's about half a percent, of fission products. They are the, the radioactive elements, the byproducts of nuclear fission that are very radioactive for a shorter period. So after sort of two or three hundred years, they've decayed back to to zero, basically, to, to almost zero, and they can often be used to repurpose. So we've now kind of got those two separated out. One goes into a reactor, destroyed. The fission products can either be used as a heat source, stored at surface, and then you know recycled in two or three hundred years, or disposed of underground. And we have various options. But then the roughly 99% is essentially low activity uranium close to what was originally what was originally started hmm. the uranium that came from the ground and, and so, so that's the big kind of saving here is we're taking that large amount of high level waste right. and getting the big volume back down to regular low radioactivity uranium so if we can dispose of that now in an intermediate level waste repository mm -hmm. or a much safer form it depends on the country you can have very significant social environmental and economic savings well that's amazing we Sounds think great. so, um, <laughs> but the, the but of course is um, there's a lot of you know details to this. So all of our R and D and our work at the moment is validating exactly the amount of separations, the contamination levels of each of those streams, um, and what waste repository they can actually go into. Yes. So we're working with them. Um, that's what we're doing. That's what our R and D is leading towards to verify all of our claims on this, which is all going on the right track. And we're working with Canada's Nuclear Waste Management Organization to, to verify the different routes and what would happen. So, so I know sorry. you guys had an ARPA-E grant right, several years ago um, from the US side. Um, are you working with CNL? Or do you have your own in-house laboratories? Do you have your own in-house kind of research staff at this point working on this? Yeah, we have our own um, labs with the uh, uranium licenses. Um, so we're doing some of the work. Some of the Typically, we do the smaller work ourselves so that we can understand the details. So we have some corrosion experiments. Um, some heat transfer experiments and some um, and of the, the Watts recycling experiments uh, with just uranium and then other fi non-radioactive fission products or you know elements that represent the other transuranics. Um, and yeah, and typically we do those experiments really to scope out the details, make sure nothing goes wrong, and then we can give the big labs very specific, narrow experimental descriptions so that they, they don't have to do all that discovery because typically their rates are rather high. Right. <laughs> right. They cost exactly. a bit more. So we do the exploratory work, make sure we've really got it precise and then right. give it to the big labs. Right, but it's also really great. I mean, like uh, not only kind of creating a body of knowledge that's beyond kind of you know, the private sector, but that really kind of serves you know, a, a greater a greater you know good right in terms of um, you know public funded research, um, but also kind of getting that reputational credibility from from national laboratories from you know other outside stakeholders. I'm sure is yeah is very important. Yeah. Well. Well, so the RPE example you mentioned is a little different because that was um, the RPE typically funds more innovative mm -hmm. uh, ideas and topics. So that enabled us to leverage some of the U.S. capabilities a little more than we would usually have been able to. And the first grant was um, $2.2 .2 million plus various extensions over the couple of years. And the, the core of the project was looking at you know, radically innovative construction techniques mm. to accelerate uh, the construction process. So, so getting back to the, to the plant then, um, so obviously you have the, the, the main innovation really is in the, the fuel and the reactor, but there's of course the whole balance of plant that you know, has your steam cycles and your cooling and all of these different things. Can you talk to me a little bit about the rest of the plant is it kind of just like a, a standard nuclear power plant or a standard thermal plant or um, are there other innovations uh, in, in that side as well um there, there there are and there aren't so we have sort of three technologies so we've talked about watts as a recycling plant uh, the ssrw stable salt reactor waste burner is the reactor and then we have grid reserve grid reserve, grid reserve is the energy storage which is uh, you know exactly a copy and paste from the commercial concentrated solar power plants. They are you know, mirrors in a circle that reflect the sun off a molten salt in a tower. Right. And they put that molten salt into large tanks that can store it as thermal energy so that they can get constant electricity. Yeah. We do the reverse. We have high temperature, clean energy from a nuclear power plant. So we store that heat as molten salt in these big large tanks and then we can have whatever size turbine we want to use the store, stored heat in those big tanks and from the reactor together so that overall you've got a peaking plant rather than nuclear baseload. So most of the, um, 
the, the, the SMRs, they talk about variable plants, and what right. they mean is they can actually ramp down. So if they have a 300 megawatt reactor, they can ramp down to 100 and back up to 300. We've designed the reactor so that it runs at full capacity all the mm -hmm. time, mm -hmm. but stores the heat when you don't need, you know, when all wind and solar is, is going at full speed. Um, and so you're storing the heat in these tanks. And if we have a 300 megawatt reactor, the example we give is we can store the heat in the tanks for say 16 hours. Okay. And then you could have a 900 megawatt turbine running for eight hours a day wow. to follow demand. And so, okay, so is all of this then focused on electricity use or can you also use that heat for, for other applications? It really doesn't matter. So we've designed, our, what we design is the standard reactor, standard recycling plant watts with a minimum size of grid reserve, like an hour storage, um, which is required for our safety case. The customer can have any size storage and any size turbine they want. And so it's totally site specific, whatever they need. So if it's, a, if it's an industrial plant, they just use that heat directly for you know, whatever their industrial need is. If it's a, you know, a big customer like OPG or MB Power, they will likely want you know, big, oh. flexible um, turbines. So you know, in New Brunswick, we're, we're talking about turbines that are a little bigger than 300 to give that flexibility. Mm -hmm. But um, what's, what's also very advantageous is because we're high temperature, we can have regular thermal um, uh, turbines. How high temperature was the, the max? Thermal? The output's around 550 after we've gone through, so the reactor output temperature is higher, but um, because of the, the limiting temperature of these molten salts in the storage, mm. the temperature that gets back into the turbine is around 550, 560. Great. Um, which is perfect for thermal power plants. That's exactly the same temperature mm -hmm. as coal, superheated steam. So, you know, we've been talking to the turbine manufacturers and they're giving us quotes, which are exactly the same turbines as used in the, in the coal industry. Mm -hmm. So for replacing coal plants, it's, you know, it's absolutely straightforward. We can use any coal plant mm -hmm. uh, or CCGT steam, coal plant, steam turbine, biomass. It's all the same. And the costs are, cost difference is huge. In the original cost estimates we had for a thousand megawatt plant in the original design, it was, <laughs> the difference in the turbine cost was one billion pounds. For a thousand megawatt nuclear turbine compared to a, uh, a, a, a non-nuclear, and they were costs from the same supplier. Right, right, and that's just because of you know different qualifications uh, for different the same. qualifications. Um, well, and typical nuclear is a lower t in, in light water reactors is around three hundred degree mm. centigrade mm -hmm. output temperature. So your turbines are double diameter roughly, oh, and right. they they're way lower efficiency. Yes. Yes, but because you're using the same ones that are used they're for They're making coal one a week, they're right. rolling them off a factory, right. and right. they just make them cheaper. That's fantastic. Yeah, that makes a big difference in the bottom line. Right, well, I mean, kind of speaking about, you know, this, this therm I, first of all, actually, I'm really surprised, but I think that's a really great, um, you know, use of the technology. And when you think about the decarbonization, right, kind of taking this full circle back to wind turbines, right? Even in, in Canada, where we have variable renewable use, this is a perfect, you know, kind of solution to, to marry that that future energy mix where we're going to need this different types of capacity and decarbonizing in the industry, as you said. Yeah, that's what we really tried to do. We tried to design it so that we're actually enabling more renewables because mm. without this flexible solution, renewables can only get to about 30, 35 percent of the grid. But if you have this, you know, nuclear peaking plant, mm -hmm. you can have 60, maybe even 70 percent renewables with this nuclear peaking plant and you have a very reliable, stable grid. So that's that's the kind of aim is to enable that. Well, fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Rory. This has been a really, really fascinating conversation. It's been great fun. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, I've really enjoyed learning so much about it. Thank you so much for, for stopping by. Yeah, thanks for having me and enjoy the rest of the conference. Awesome. Yeah. And initiate at least a new approach to the many difficult problems that must be solved in both private and public conversations. If the world is to take off the inertia imposed by fear and is to make positive progress for peace.